Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are switched to silence. Apologies have been received today from Jackson Carlaw, and I would like to welcome Dean Lockhart, who will be substituting for Jackson uh, to the meeting and to invite him to declare any relevant interests. Uh, good morning, Convener. Thank you very much. I am a member of the Law Society of England and Wales. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lockhart. Uh, our first item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations. Uh, the focus of today's session will be the circumstances relating to Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the Consul General of Ireland to Scotland, Mark Hannafy. Mr Hannafy, would you like to make an opening statement? I would please, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, good morning to you, Convener. I'd like to, uh, to express my thanks to you and uh, to the members of the committee for uh, your invitation to participate in this session this morning and to discuss the perspective of the Irish government on the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and the negotiation process that is currently underway. As I think you probably all know, we were deeply disappointed at the UK's decision to leave the European Union but we respect the democratic decision of UK voters. Our principal objective now is to try to make the best of a Brexit that we hoped would never come to pass and to limit the negative consequences for Ireland, for the British-Irish relationship and for the European Union as a whole. Our priorities are clear. We want to protect the gains of the Northern Ireland peace process, including by protecting the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts and avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland. We want to maintain the common travel area between Ireland and the UK. We want to minimise the impact of Brexit on trade and the economy, maintaining a close trading relationship between the UK and the EU, including Ireland. And we want to influence in a positive way the future of the European Union itself. The key priority issues for Ireland have been prominently reflected in the EU's negotiating guidelines and directives for the withdrawal negotiations, which are being led by Michel Barnier and his team at the European Commission on behalf of the European Union. In particular, the European Council and the European Parliament have recognised the unique situation and the specific circumstances which apply on the island of Ireland. As you know, the question of Ireland and Northern Ireland is one of the areas on which it has been decided that sufficient progress must be made in this first phase of negotiations before a second phase focusing on the broader question of the future UK-EU relationship can begin. The European Council will take stock of the progress achieved in the negotiations so far at its October meeting in about four weeks' time. While some progress has been made in the negotiations, in some areas more than in others, October is fast approaching and further progress is needed. It is not the case that all issues relating to Ireland and Northern Ireland need to be fully resolved before the next phase of negotiations can be opened, and we do acknowledge that it will be difficult to determine how certain border issues will be resolved until we know what new arrangements will be put in place between the UK and the European Union. But it must be clear that both sides are beginning to converge on a shared understanding of how these issues should be addressed. We very much hope that the British government will engage fully on all of the phase one issues, including the financial settlement, citizens' rights and the Ireland issues, so that tangible progress can be made and the critical discussions on the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union can begin. Real progress on these phase one issues will help to build trust and confidence in the process and help to ensure that the complex negotiations ahead have the best possible chance of a positive outcome. Overall, we believe that we all, Ireland, Britain and the European Union, need to work towards the closest possible future relationship between the UK and the EU, towards an orderly exit, and towards a substantial transition period that allows everyone to prepare adequately for new realities. Such an approach will provide certainty for businesses and allow companies to plan and to invest. The Irish government believes that such a transition period must maintain the status quo in terms of membership of the customs union and the single market. It would be unreasonable to expect businesses to have to adjust to new arrangements twice. Our key objective in relation to Northern Ireland is to ensure that the gains of the hard-won peace process there are protected. Part of this involves protecting our all-island economy. It has supported peace and facilitated the normalisation of relations on our island allowing people to get on with their daily lives. More than a third of Northern Ireland's exports travel south across our near invisible border every year. 
Much commentary is focused on the challenges for the movement of goods across the border. But the Irish government has consistently highlighted that the challenges of the border are about more than that. It's about people's lives and their livelihoods. It's about the border region being able to develop and to prosper. It's about the potential psychological and social impacts on communities. The European Commission Task Force has recently published a set of guiding principles for the dialogue on Ireland and Northern Ireland as part of the Article 50 negotiation process. The UK is a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, and this paper makes it clear that it is the UK's responsibility to propose workable solutions when it comes to the border, to overcome the challenges created by the UK's decision to leave the European Union. It also stresses that the situation regarding the border on the island of Ireland will require a unique solution, which cannot pre-configure other future arrangements for the EU-UK relationship, including on trade and customs. We have examined very carefully the ideas on a new customs relationship that the UK put forward in its position paper published last month. On the face of it, these ideas do not seem to be consistent with the shared objective of avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland while respecting the integrity of the EU's single market, in which Ireland will continue to play a full part. Our Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Simon Coveney, has made the point that streamlined customs arrangements are unlikely to be streamlined enough for businesses whose margins are tight, and that while a customs partnership has some promise as an idea, this will simply not be feasible if it is undercut by the UK making trade deals with countries that don't share our standards or systems. The obvious solution to address the difficulties that Brexit poses for Northern Ireland, if we really value the peace and prosperity that has been built on the foundation provided by the Good Friday Agreement, is for the UK to remain in an extended customs union and single market, or some version of that concept. We believe that this option would be in the interests of Ireland, of Britain, and of the European Union as a whole, and it deserves to be fully explored and considered, rather than being taken off the table before negotiations on a future trading relationship between the UK and the EU have even commenced. We very much hope that we can move on soon to discussions on that future relationship, and that we can achieve an outcome which provides for the closest possible future UK-EU relationship that is consistent with the integrity of the single market and the principles which have guided the development of the European Union. And we have made it very clear too that in respect of its connection with the EU in the future, the door always remains open for the United Kingdom. So thank you very much, convener, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Hannafy. Uh, can I open by asking you, you talked about... Uh, the obvious solution uh, is for the UK to remain within a uh, customs union and uh, uh, as close as possible to the single market. Is, is, that, is that the kind of progress that you would like to see uh, in terms of this first stage? Would, is that what you would expect to see before we can say that we've moved on in October? I think it's unlikely that we would get fully there in these, this first stage of negotiations. Uh -huh. um, it's clear, as I, I said in my statement, that we're not expecting all the issues to be resolved in respect of the, the first phase questions uh, before the European Council is, is in a position to make a judgment that sufficient progress has been made on those issues. Uh, but it should be clear that both sides in the negotiation are beginning to converge on a shared understanding of the essential principles that are at stake and a shared understanding of the direction in which the negotiations need to move to solve the key issues that, uh, that need to be addressed, including the difficulties in relation to, to Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, so I, I don't think we need to, to get to a, a, a full exploration of those ideas because they do encompass questions connected with the broader future UK-EU trading relationship, which are not phase one issues. Uh, but at the same time, I think if a, an openness uh, to contemplating that solution was demonstrated as part of, of the phase one negotiations, that would be extremely helpful in demonstrating that progress in the negotiations is being made. And do you feel that because it's been taken off the table, as you say, that progress can't be achieved in that stage one? Uh, no, I, I don't think it, it rules out the prospect of sufficient progress being achieved. Um, we await further information and suggestions from the UK side in relation to the proposals that it uh, will be putting on the table uh, to address the difficulties that Brexit is likely to pose for Ireland and Northern Ireland and in particular in relation to border arrangements. Um, we do make the point and the European Commission has made this point through its essential principles paper published two weeks ago that it is very much incumbent on the United Kingdom to come to us with those suggested solutions. Uh, we are open to receiving them and considering them. 
Uh, but in the absence of, of what we would consider to be workable solutions emerging at this stage from the United Kingdom side, um, the prospect of continued customs union and single market membership seems to us to be the obvious idea which deserves exploration. Right. What, could you just perhaps go into detail about some of the, the challenges that, that could be posed if you don't achieve your objectives? What, what would the challenges in a, a practical day-to-day -day way be for the all-Ireland economy? Well, the reimposition of, of a hard border between the Republic and Northern Ireland would have very significant impacts economically, politically, psychologically in terms of the progress that has been achieved in the peace process since the signature of the Good Friday Agreement uh, in 1998. Um, we have gone through a, a, a process of, of essentially social and economic integration uh, between Northern Ireland and, and the Republic, between communities on both sides of the border, on north and south. Um, much of the economy in border regions, particularly the agricultural economy, is, uh, is highly integrated. They say that hundreds of thousands of litres of milk uh, travel back and forth across the border uh, every week for processing. Uh, that there are something like uh, half a million pigs that travel from south of the border to north every year for processing. 350,000 sheep that travel from north to south for processing. Um, it has become normal for businesses and for economic actors on one side of the border uh, to also conduct business without hindrance on the other side of the border. Any uh, reimposition of a hard border, any difficulties that might be uh, encountered uh, by businesses, particularly small and medium enterprises in that region, in continuing to operate and to trade in that way, could have very difficult consequences for the economy of border communities. There's also the question of the psychological impact of a reimposition of a border on the island. Uh, we've moved in the past 20 years away from uh, a, a, a highly controlled uh, border arrangement. Uh, that has helped to ensure that the dividends of the peace process are very visible and tangible for communities in Northern Ireland. It's helped to ensure normalization of political relationships on the island of Ireland. And any sign that momentum in that direction is starting to reverse could have difficult and unpredictable political consequences and consequences for communities on the island. And that's something we would, uh, we would very much wish to avoid uh, as, this, uh, as this process continues. Right. And what you're saying is that the UK proposals do not, uh, do not dissuade those concerns then? Uh, right now, uh, the proposals that were included in the uh, UK position paper, which was published last month, are interesting and certainly deserve examination. But there were two, I suppose, key suggestions uh, included in, in, that, in that paper. They talked about the possibility of, of streamlined customs arrangements uh, and uh, equally the possibility of uh, a close uh, customs partnership between, uh, between the United Kingdom uh, and the European Union. There was a lot in that paper that, that we welcome, and uh, the very fact that, that uh, ideas and suggestions were put down in, in writing and circulated to us is welcome. Um, the commitment in that paper to, uh, to avoiding uh, any physical border infrastructure for any purpose uh, on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland is also very welcome, but it's, it's a lot easier said than done. And in respect of the two options which were suggested in the paper, in terms of the highly streamlined arrangements, um, as, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we believe that these uh, arrangements are unlikely to be streamlined enough uh, for businesses <laughs> operating in the border region. Um, we'll be starting from, from the same place in terms of, of single market regulations on either side of the border, but as time progresses, uh, regulations and arrangements will inevitably diverge uh, as the UK negotiates, as, as it intends to do, trade deals with third countries. And this means that uh, more paperwork, more customs checks, and more red tape will uh, inevitably emerge, chipping away at the, uh, at the tight margins of, of uh, cross-border businesses. And uh, that's without getting to the question of the impact that, uh, that more of a border on the island would have on the peace process. In terms of the new customs partnership that was suggested, um, the idea certainly does have some promise, but as currently put forward, we believe it could be a logistical nightmare to operate. Uh, and it would also only prove viable, in our view, if the UK is prepared not to negotiate separate trade deals with third countries, and instead is prepared to take advantage of the trade deals that the EU itself has concluded and is currently negotiating with major economies like, like Canada and Japan. So certainly the, the publication of the paper by the UK side is welcome, uh, but we don't believe that the ideas contained in the paper at this stage are sufficient to solve the problems. Uh, that, uh, that we're facing. Thank you very much. I'll now pass over to Lewis McDonald. <coughs> Thank you very much. And the UK government 
as you know, Consul General has published a couple of papers, one of which relates to potential future relationships, which you've just described in some detail, and the other relating to Northern Ireland and Ireland specifically and, and issues arising from that. Um, I suspect the UK government would say, well, we've set out our objectives. Everyone agrees with objectives like retaining the common travel area, protecting the peace process, uh, and uh, maintaining free movement uh, of people and goods ac across the border. So what's the problem would be, I suspect, uh, a UK government perspective. Uh, can you outline perhaps what the problem is and what it is that requires other than the statement of good intentions in order for that to actually work in practice? I think the problem is reconciling those objectives um, and whether the broader objectives which have been set out by the United Kingdom are mutually compatible. Um, and the big difficulty that we see uh, is the potential incompatibility between solutions that might be proposed for the Irish border and the intention of the United Kingdom uh, to leave the customs union, leave the single market, and conclude separate and distinct United Kingdom-only trade deals uh, with other economies. And it is very difficult to see how that circle can be squared and how border arrangements, uh, which are consistent with the integrity of the European Union single market, in which the Irish state will continue to play a full part, uh, how border arrangements which are consistent with those uh, single market commitments uh, can be designed in a context where the United Kingdom uh, is determined uh, to vary its customs and economic arrangements uh, significantly from those which apply within the European Union. I was very struck in your opening statement that you made the comment that uh, it would be in uh, everybody's interest and, and would enable progress in Ireland particularly if the UK was to remain in the customs union and single market in the transitional phase, presumably for two or three years beyond March 2019. I wonder if you'd expand on that and, and, and explain uh, what that would allow in terms of uh, uh, negotiating and agreeing longer term arrangements that would protect the position in Ireland. Well, it certainly allows time uh, for further exploration of, of the future arrangements uh, that might be agreed at the end of this negotiation process. Um, we've consistently stressed the importance of, of robust transitional arrangements in order to provide certainty and provide continuity uh, both to citizens and to businesses um, and to ensure that there is an orderly and, and calm transition uh, from uh, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union to a future UK-EU partnership. We do think that the importance of those transitional arrangements and the value of such arrangements is now very broadly understood as being in the best interests of all parties concerned, uh, the UK, Ireland, and, and the broader European Union. Um, it's fair to note that in its paper on, on future customs and trading arrangements, which you, you mentioned a little earlier, um, the UK itself has put forward a proposal for what it terms an, an interim period of close association with the EU customs union, uh, which is a, a, a positive indication of, of thinking on the United Kingdom side. We are looking very carefully at this and at other proposals in the UK paper, along with our, our EU partners and with the European Commission Task Force, um, in light of the, the parameters that are there, in light of the European Council guidelines and negotiating directives agreed by the Council. Uh, but to be fair, it has to be said that in terms of, of the, uh, the possible nature of those transition arrangements, it is a matter that we will only be able to address formally once we have made sufficient progress on the, uh, the terms of the orderly withdrawal and have been able to move into phase two of the negotiation process. And we very much hope that we get there very soon. That, that's an important point. And clearly the, the, the easiest transitional arrangement is one where the current uh, provisions continue to apply for a transitional period. But, but what would, given, given, that that's, given that possibility at least exists um, for the period 2019 to 2021 or two, what, is, what would the Irish government consider to be sufficient progress on the withdrawal agreement in relation to Ireland uh, in the period uh, between now and March 2019? Well, I mean, the, the formal judgment on, on what constitutes sufficient progress will be made by the European Council as a whole uh, meeting in, in, in October. Um, as I said in my, my introductory comments, we, we're consistently making the point, you know, there is, is a certain misapprehension sometimes about the, the nature of the progress that, that has to be achieved or the scale of the progress that has to be achieved. We are not suggesting that everything needs to be signed and sealed 
we're not suggesting that a deal has to be agreed which will cover comprehensively all the issues which arise for Ireland and Northern Ireland as a result of Brexit before the second phase of negotiations can be opened. But it does need to be clear that uh, both sides are converging on a shared understanding of what solutions might be, might be arrived at and a shared understanding of the principles which should uh, guide those solutions as, uh, as the negotiations progress. We will be in a phase, once, once the, the second phase of, of, of uh, negotiations begins, we will be in a phase essentially of parallel negotiation, where discussions on the future relationship will be taking place alongside discussions on the uh, remaining elements of negotiation on the, the phase one issues and, and kind of tying down uh, formal ways of, of addressing those issues. Um, we do have two rounds of negotiation yet to come before the, the European Council meets in October and makes its, its judgment on the question of whether sufficient progress has been made on, on the withdrawal issues. Let's see how they go. And uh, let's see whether uh, we do get to a point in mid-October uh, where it is possible for the European Council to make the judgment that progress has been sufficient, that, that confidence has been built in the process, that the foundations are there uh, for phase two negotiations to begin. Yeah, and, and briefly, an indication from the UK government when the Prime Minister speaks this week that she understands the principles uh, of that transitional period and of the ultimate destination uh, would, in your mind, uh, constitute a, a signal of progress in the right, of, of convergence on uh, shared principles. Yes, convergence on principles would be would be very valuable, and that, that is, is is the purpose of the essential principles and guiding principles papers that the European Commission Task Force has been publishing over the last number of weeks. It sets out uh, the understanding from the. Uh, the European Union side of the key principles that should be reflected in any agreement or deal on, on the phase one issues. And if there can be convergence on those, then that moves us uh, very far in, in the phase one process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dean Lockhart. Yes, thank you. I'd like to explore the question of uh, trade deals and if the UK uh, post-Brexit enters into uh, trade deals uh, off the back of the existing EU trade deals with, for example, Japan, um, the Canada trade deal that came into effect today, and other countries. If the UK does that, would that minimise your concern about the divergence of regulations going forward? Because the UK's uh, trade relationships with uh, third countries would map and be the same as the EU's trade relationships? It would certainly help. And if there is a guarantee that the, the nature of the trading relationship between the United Kingdom and third countries parallels that of the European Union with those third countries, um, then that would certainly, it seems to me, uh, help to resolve certain difficulties which, which might exist about the compatibility of, of single market and trading regulations within the European Union and the United Kingdom's external economic relationships. There would, however, I, I would imagine, have to be a guarantee that there wouldn't be subsequent divergence uh, between the, the trading relationships which exist between the European Union and third countries and the United Kingdom and third countries in order to ensure that uh, long-term arrangements for a trading relationship between a, a very free and, and unfettered trading relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union uh, could continue in the longer term. Okay, thank you. And just one follow-up question. Uh, obviously, while the UK is part of the customs union, um, formal negotiations with third countries can't take place in terms of free trade uh, agreements. But um, that doesn't stop informal heads of trade or informal uh, negotiations taking place in terms of what a trade agreement might look like uh, post-Brexit. Do how, how far down the track, and I appreciate this is uh, depending on some, some different uh, scenarios, but how far down the track do you think the shape of a trade agreement could be outlined uh, between the UK and Ireland over the next couple of years before, and you know, assuming if, one scenario, the UK leaves the customs union, do you think uh, the outlines of a trade agreement uh, could be in place? Well, I mean, it's not the case that there will be a trade agreement between the UK and Ireland. Uh, the, there won't be a, a, a bilateral process as, as part of this negotiation. Uh, negotiations will be handled between the United Kingdom on the one side sure. and, and the European Union on the other. Uh, an ultimate uh, agreement which is reached between the UK and the European Union will obviously reflect elements which uh, encompass the specific circumstances and unique circumstances on, on the island of Ireland, which have been widely recognised. Uh, but the arrangements to govern the economic relationship between Ireland and the United Kingdom in the future will be encompassed within a, a broader UK-EU agreement once, once we reach the end of this negotiating process. We very much hope, obviously, that, uh, that those relations uh, can be as close and as productive as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Gujon, please. 
Thank you. You mentioned in your opening statement about, uh, you know, this isn't just about goods moving across the border. This is something that very much affects people's day-to-day -day lives and will have a, a massive impact. And it's really that that I would like to ask about and the issue of citizens' rights. And just to get your views on uh, the UK's position paper that was put forward on that and how you see this developing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the impact on... on communities and the impact on society uh, in Northern Ireland uh, that Brexit uh, might have if, if things can't be sorted out in a, in, in a positive way um, is very significant. Um, there are impacts on communities on both sides of the border. I've mentioned some of the, of the economic impacts. There are impacts on north-south cooperation in many sectors. Um, I think it's, it's useful to reflect on the fact that the Good Friday Agreement itself, which is, is the founding document of the Northern Ireland peace process, uh, was agreed at a time when uh, the relationship between uh, Britain and Ireland and between Northern Ireland and the Republic uh, was always assumed uh, to, to uh, take place in the framework of shared European Union membership. And uh, references to the European Union and to cooperation within the framework of shared European Union membership are regular within the, the Good Friday Agreement and the associated documents which govern both North-South and East-West institutions arising from that agreement. The North-South Ministerial Council, for example, has a specific role in, in addressing European Union policy questions. Uh, the British-Irish Council, which was established on foot of the Good Friday Agreement to provide a framework for relations between the UK and Irish governments and the devolved administrations on these islands, as well as the, the administrations in the Channel Islands, um, is also tasked with a discussion on relevant European Union issues. Um, the absence of that supporting European Union framework uh, for that cooperation uh, brings us into a, a very new paradigm um, and it's, it is uh, difficult uh, to, to anticipate precisely what impact the, the absence of, of shared European Union membership might have on uh, those opportunities for cross-border cooperation. Even in sectors like, uh, like transport where, for example, the uh, the Irish government is providing funding towards uh, the upgrading of, of the road, which stretches, I think it's the A9, which stretches between um, Oma and, and up towards Derry and, and Donegal. Um, in areas like healthcare, where um, there are arrangements, for example, for um, patients, cardiac patients who require access to emergency services in Donegal to access those services in Atnagelvan Hospital in Derry, there are cooperation arrangements which allow uh, children who require paediatric uh, cardiac care and cardiac surgery from throughout Northern Ireland to access those services uh, at the, the Irish National Children's Hospital in, in Crumlin in Dublin. Um, we are hoping and assuming that those types of cross-border cooperation uh, can continue without hindrance in, in, in a, uh, a post-Brexit scenario, but there will be more difficulties than were anticipated when the frameworks for that cooperation were originally put in place. And uh, that could, could present challenges for us, even in terms of, of divergence of, of standards, of recognition of, of qualifications, mm. uh, recognition of, of product standards for, for medical and healthcare products. Those, those issues uh, could arise and, and could require some effort uh, to, uh, to deal with. Um, in terms of, of the second half of your question in relation to, to citizens' rights, um, we've obviously examined very carefully the, the paper and the proposals put on the table by the United Kingdom. Um, it's an issue which is being discussed in detail in the context of the negotiating rounds between the UK and the EU in Brussels. Uh, it does seem to be the case that there is at least a degree of, of political convergence on what the UK and the EU sides want to see as the net effect in terms of the, the experience of UK citizens in the United Kingdom and the experience of UK citizens elsewhere in the European Union at the end of this process. Um, there is a, a divergence of views still on, on, I suppose, the mechanisms and, and the mm -hmm. governance of those arrangements into the future. Um, those issues will be discussed during the next two rounds of negotiations. Um, but I think it is possible to say that we're, we're hopeful of good progress in those areas uh, reasonably soon. Thank you. And just further to that, what would be the Irish government's uh, view on uh, what else, what do you think needs to be agreed in terms of, of citizens' rights uh, as part of that withdrawal agreement? I mean, we, our, our position is, is very clearly aligned with the, the European Union's position and, and the, the position paper that has been, been published uh, by the Commission Task Force um, on the question of citizens' rights. Um, 
we are, are looking at this from a, a unique perspective as well in that the uh, regulations which govern the, the residence of, of Irish citizens here in the United Kingdom uh, are derived principally from the common travel area uh, uh, arrangement between Ireland and the UK rather than necessarily from the rights of Irish nationals as EU citizens. Um, that is something which has been uh, clearly recognised by, by uh, the European Union side and by the UK side. There's a commitment on all sides to preserve those common travel area arrangements. Um, they have been uh, recognised in the, the European Council negotiating guidelines. Um, we are obviously discussing them in great detail as part of the negotiating process. It's one of the areas on which we do believe that good progress has already been made in the negotiations between the UK and the EU sides. Um, our legal analysis at this stage suggests that there is nothing in the current common travel area arrangements which are in any way incompatible with European Union law, even in a situation where uh, one of the parties to that common travel area is a continuing European Union member state and another party is not. Um, the United Kingdom has made very clear, uh, very publicly, that it does not intend uh, to put in place any regulations which would affect the ability of EEA nationals to uh, travel freely through the common travel area. Um, that is, is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, it does mean, I think, that we should be able to reach a, a good solution in, in terms of the, the maintenance of the common travel area post-Brexit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, convener, it's, uh, to follow up on a couple of the questions from uh, Dean Lockhart, um, can you provide the, the committee with uh, the percentages of the level of trade from Ireland to the UK, but also the level of trade from Ireland to the EU that, go, that travels via the UK, please? Uh, overall, the level of trade between uh, Ireland and the United Kingdom, we export uh, about 17% of our overall exports uh, to, to the UK. Um, about 40, between 40 and 45 percent of our overall export trade goes to, to continental Europe, to, to what will be the EU27 uh, post-Brexit. Um, it is the case that quite a significant proportion of the goods that are shipped from Ireland to continental Europe transit through the, uh, the United Kingdom, use the, as it were, the British land bridge to physically get from Ireland to the UK. Um, I don't have a, a definite statistic that I can, I can give you on that now. I can check it and come back to you if, if you would like. Um, but certainly the importance of that land bridge and the continuation of the facilitation of goods trade between Ireland and, uh, and continental Europe via the United Kingdom is something that, is, uh, that has been recognised in the, uh, the European Union uh, papers uh, that have been published and uh, is something which is being taken into account uh, in the context of the negotiations that are underway. It's fair to say that there is an equivalent uh, issue of, of, of sorts in that quite a, a proportion of, of the uh, trade which moves between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom actually transits through the territory of, of the Republic, you know, is, is, is maybe shipped on a, on a lorry to, to Dublin and, and then on a ferry to, to Liverpool or to, to, uh, to Wales. And uh, as a result of that, there is a, an equivalent uh, issue there that needs to be addressed uh, on, on the United Kingdom side. But we are, we are confident that that issue is, is well understood on both sides and uh, that progress will be made in finding an arrangement to ensure that that, uh, that type of trade can continue post-Brexit. So it's certainly in, in your opening comments uh, this morning when you spoke about the, the issue of the transitional arrangements uh, and that it would be unreasonable for businesses uh, to, to make changes twice uh, if an agreement uh, couldn't take place. Uh, but following on from your, your percentages that you just highlighted there and also the issue of the land bridge, um, I think that it makes that point even stronger. Uh, uh, I'm sure you would agree that, uh, that the trans a transitional arrangement is, uh, arranged, is sorted out uh, between uh, the UK and the EU to ensure that, uh, that business uh, in Ireland uh, doesn't suffer as a consequence. Absolutely. Any change in regulations imposes costs on business. Um, and it does not seem to us to be reasonable to suggest to businesses, many of whom, as I've said, are trading across the border on the island of Ireland or between Ireland and the United Kingdom, who operate on very tight margins, it does not seem to us to be reasonable to suggest that those business, businesses should be required to adjust themselves to one new set of circumstances, a new set of regulations and arrangements, and then 
a short number of years later to have to transition yet again to a completely new set of circumstances and regulations and arrangements. And as a result of that, uh, our view is that a prolongation of current arrangements through continued UK participation in the customs union and single market during a transitional period would make the most sense for everybody involved. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank good. you. And um, Tavish Scott. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of questions about money, um, if I may? Um, the progress towards actually, uh, uh, the, well, the progress um, is, that's meant to be judged in the Council, the Council of Ministers in in October will, to a large extent, depend on money. Theresa May is going to say something about money, we are told, tomorrow. What do you think constitutes progress on money? Um, the first thing to say in, in relation to, to, to the question of the financial settlement is that it has to be very clear that what we're talking about in relation to the financial settlement is seeking a commitment from the United Kingdom to honour its, its obligations and it, the commitments that it has made as a member state of the European Union. Um, it's not about imposing a bill or a charge on the United Kingdom for leaving, and it's not about punishing the United Kingdom or, or seeking to dissuade it from taking the action that it has chosen to take. Um, the UK itself has stated very clearly that it intends to work with the European Union uh, to determine a fair settlement of the UK's rights and obligations as a departing member state in accordance with the law and in the spirit of continuing partnership. Um, from an Irish perspective, we fully support the European Union position, which tries to approach the issue in what we think is, is a fair and a transparent way, based on a, a clear methodology which is agreed between both sides and which is objective. Um, in terms of the judgment on whether sufficient progress on this issue uh, will have been made by October, uh, again, I, I have to repeat that, that we're not looking for final agreement. Sure. Um, yeah. We are simply looking for uh, a, a situation where it is clear that a, a convergence of views is developing, uh, that a, a shared way of approaching this issue is emerging, and where it appears clear that it, it will be possible uh, to get ourselves ultimately at the end of the negotiation process to an agreed conclusion which, which both sides can accept. And if um, and it is an if because the UK government haven't yet have yet to apply for transit for a transitional period, whatever however long that transitional period may be. But but if the UK government applies for it and it's assumed again that the Prime Minister will do that tomorrow in some way, um, the view is that that will mean a charge per year to remain in, as you were saying earlier on, the single current the single market. Uh, and the common and the and the uh, customs union. There are costs associated with single mar single market yeah. membership. You know, there are there are single market institutions which need to be yeah, funded. Precisely. There are regulatory bodies which have to to pay their staff and yeah. and and fund their operations. And as a result of that, a a state which participates in the single market, uh, I think, would quite reasonably be expected to make a financial contribution yeah. to the the running of that single market and those single market institutions. And it's a principle which is is understood by states which are outside the European Union but still participate uh, to a degree in the single market. Uh, and I think that it would be understood that a similar provision should apply in respect of the United Kingdom. So we'd all hope tomorrow when this speech is made in Florence that these things would be set out in some clarity which would help us all enormously in understanding the UK government's position. It would help us all and I admire your optimism. Yeah, I, I, I am not. I am not. <laughs> but thank you, I will say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Well, it's really just um, to say that I think there is goodwill on both sides and you have sort of said there are positive steps to uh, come to an agreed conclusion. Um, I just wondered, uh, was there anything that you wanted Theresa May to set out in her speech tomorrow? Because it seems as though she will make uh, Northern Ireland a priority as well as the, um, the financial settlement or the divorce uh, bill, if you like. I just wondered what perhaps you were hoping that she might set out um, over and above what you've talked about as the status quo in a frictionless border? Mm. To be fair, you know, the, the importance of Northern Ireland uh, and the priority that needs to be attached to Northern Ireland in the context of this negotiation process uh, has been acknowledged very clearly by the United Kingdom side, by the United Kingdom government. Um, it was there in the Lancaster House speech that the Prime Minister made in, in January. It was there in the Article 50 notification letter that was submitted at the end of March. Um, we do know that there is goodwill and a commitment to work very hard to resolve the issues, find a way of resolving the issues uh, that Brexit uh, poses for Northern Ireland. 
Um, but we do have to make the point, and it's a point which is emphasised in the, the recent uh, EU guiding principles paper in respect of Ireland and Northern Ireland, that Brexit is a British choice. Uh, we are perfectly content with the status quo in respect of arrangements on the island of Ireland and would like to see it continue. Uh, it is Britain that is choosing to, to change um, that status quo. And in that context, it is incumbent on the United Kingdom government uh, to come up with solutions and suggestions for how it wishes to proceed in terms of its overall policy objectives in a way which allows us to preserve, insofar as is possible, the arrangements which currently exist on the island of Ireland in respect of North-South cooperation, in respect of the open border, and in respect of the, the full continued implementation of all provisions of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, we have suggested that a commitment to continued single market and customs union membership would be one way of solving that. That is on the table. And uh, we wait to see what other suggestions or ideas the United Kingdom wishes to put on the table as part of the negotiation process. Okay. So just one last question. You, I, don't, I don't foresee this, but have you made provision for the possibility of no deal? We are obviously conscious of the risk uh, of no deal. Um, you know, nothing is, is certain in terms of this negotiation process. Um, it's fair to say that we believe that a failure to reach agreement ultimately between the United Kingdom and the European Union and the, the disorderly withdrawal which would result uh, would be hugely damaging for everybody involved, for the United Kingdom itself, uh, for the European Union, and most particularly within the European Union for Ireland. For that reason, we think it is incumbent on all sides to, to act responsibly and to approach the negotiations in a constructive, a positive, a flexible and an ambitious frame of mind to ensure that a no-deal outcome with all its negative consequences can be avoided. Thank you. Thank you, Ross Greer. I'm interested in both who represents the, the North during this process and the level of scrutiny given to this issue. Um, obviously, strand two of the Belfast Agreement is incredibly difficult to fulfil when you don't have institutions in the North to be part of any North-South uh, agreement. So that not only means there's no executive working with the Scottish and uh, Welsh governments, there's no assembly <coughs> scrutinising this. That's for reasons separate to Brexit, but the resolution to it is increasingly related to that. What impact do you think the lack of functioning institutions in the North is having and, and will have on scrutiny of this? Certainly, it's far from ideal that there is no functioning executive in Belfast at the moment that in, is in a position to represent the interests of Northern Ireland in the context of UK discussions and discussions among the devolved administrations and between the devolved administrations and the UK government uh, on Brexit, because there are issues and problems and difficulties relating to Northern Ireland which are possibly not getting the attention yeah and the, the extent of, of highlighting that they deserve, given the absence of, uh, of that Northern Ireland executive. We're working very hard to encourage the parties in Northern Ireland uh, to come to an agreement which would allow uh, the executive and the assembly to, to resume their work. Um, discussions informally continue uh, all the time. Um, there is some positive momentum in those discussions at the moment. Um, recent statements um, from the DUP and Sinn Féin have been encouraging in terms of the, uh, the prospect of uh, an executive being put back together. Uh, and we would very much wish uh, to see that executive back up and running and, and back functioning to ensure that there can be uh, as, as strong as possible a voice for the interests of Northern Ireland and for communities in Northern Ireland uh, as this negotiation process uh, proceeds. Uh, I think you know, there, there is across Europe uh, a, a good understanding now of the specific difficulties that Northern Ireland faces as a result of this process. Certainly it's, it's been very prominently highlighted in the European Council guidelines, in the European Parliament's resolution on, on the Brexit negotiation process, and uh, the, the essential principles paper, the guiding principles paper published by the Commission Task Force uh, has, has reflected those issues very, very strongly. Uh, we know that uh, Michel Barnier himself has a very uh, well-developed understanding of, of those issues. Um, Giver Hofstadt, the European Parliament's lead on, on, on Brexit, uh, was actually in, in 
Belfast yesterday and visited the border regions and, and is in Dublin today. So there's certainly a good deal of attention being paid to, to Northern Ireland and to border issues. But it would certainly be extremely helpful if there was a functioning executive that was able to, uh, to use its voice in the internal United Kingdom processes to ensure that the issues relating to Northern Ireland uh, can, uh, can get the attention they deserve. Thank you. And what are the intentions in terms of parliamentary scrutiny uh, of this process within the Republic? Is, is there a Doyle committee, a, a joint committee? What's the plan? Yes, I mean, there is the, the Joint Committee on European Affairs within, within the Oireachtas is obviously following uh, the process. Um, a number of sectoral committees are also looking at the specific impact of, of Brexit on their sectors. Um, the Irish Shannad, the Senate, has, has produced a report recently on, on the impact of Brexit on Ireland. A special Senate committee was set up to, to examine uh, the issues. And uh, it's all part of a, a broader process of, of nationwide and island-wide consultation, public consultation, that's, that's been taking place over the last number of months. We have a, an all-island dialogue on Brexit, which has engaged at this stage, I think, about 1,200 uh, different stakeholders in the process looking at the overall issues that Brexit poses for Ireland and some of the sectoral issues uh, that Brexit is likely to pose in various sectors. And another uh, full plenary meeting of that all-island dialogue uh, will be taking place, I think, on the 28th of this month. Um, so there is, is a wide degree of dialogue and consultation and stakeholder participation on the Irish side. Grant, thank you. Richard Lockhead. Thank you. There are some sectors that are disproportionately important to Scotland and Ireland which will be um, affected by the withdrawal negotiations, particularly agriculture and fishing. I just wondered if you want to shed any light on what your government's thinking is in terms of the best way forward for these two sectors, particularly fishing, given that it's quite a complex situation in terms of the Irish Sea. Fishing is complex. Um, it is an area which will have to be explored in detail in the context of, of the withdrawal negotiations, and I, I don't want to, to prejudge what might come out of those, those negotiations. Um, but certainly uh, there are difficult issues which will have to be dealt with uh, in terms of arrangements uh, around the fishery sector in, uh, in a post-Brexit scenario. More broadly, agriculture and, and the food and drink sectors are uh, possibly disproportionately vulnerable, certainly in Ireland, uh, to the impacts of, of Brexit. The agri-food sector is quite integrated between, both between Ireland and Northern Ireland and indeed between Ireland and Britain. Um, I think the statistics are that about 40% of Irish agri-food exports go to the UK and about 45% of the agri-food imports that come into Ireland come from the UK. So there's clearly a great degree of, of economic integration uh, between the two countries. Um, the agricultural sector is also a, a, a key part of, of, uh, of our economy uh, in respect of employment, uh, particularly obviously in, in rural regions and in, in, in border regions. Uh, about eight and a half percent of total employment uh, in Ireland is in that sector. Um, so we're working to mitigate the impact, the possible impact of, of Brexit on that sector. We've taken some uh, measures to support the sector through our, our budget for, for 2017. Um, and we're working with our, our agricultural support agencies and our enterprise agencies to ensure that businesses in that sector are prepared for the impact of Brexit are ready to, uh, to deal with uh, the, the difficulties that it might present for them. And uh, also, I suppose, to, to diversify their export markets, um, given the risk that it might be more difficult or, or the costs of exporting into the United Kingdom uh, might be a little higher in the years ahead. I mean, there's already been a, a relatively significant impact on certain parts of the Irish agri-food sector uh, as a result of the decline in the value of sterling since the 23rd of June last year. Bordbia, which is our Overseas Promotion Agency for Irish Food estimates that Irish food and drink exporters to the UK have taken a hit of about 500 million euros in 2016 alone as a result of the decline in the value of sterling and the decline, therefore, in the value of their export trade. Uh, so that's something that's already having relatively significant impacts on, on the agri-food sector in Ireland. And just finally, in terms of the wider economy, clearly you've outlined a lot of challenges and hurdles to be overcome in this process. What upsides do you see, or does our government see, from the EU's, the UK's withdrawal from the EU? There are potentially some, and we certainly intend to take advantage of them insofar as we can. You know, we're, we're clear that the likely 
net economic impact of Brexit on Ireland is, is going to be negative. Um, so we are determined to find ways to mitigate that negative impact wherever we can. Uh, Brexit does, will leave us, uh, in essence, as the only English-speaking member state of the European Union. Uh, that obviously has benefits in terms of, of foreign direct investment. Uh, we can continue to offer a free and unfettered access to a market of 500 million people post-Brexit, which the UK may not be able to do. Uh, we have already had some successes in certain sectors in uh, attracting investments to Ireland uh, from businesses that are concerned about future trading relationships between the United Kingdom and the European Union, including, for example, in the financial services sector. We had a, a major global insurance company which announced yesterday that it would be basing its European operations in, in Dublin. Um, our enterprise agencies, the Industrial Development Authority, which leads on the promotion of Ireland as a, a destination for foreign direct investment, uh, has been having some successes in promoting Ireland as a destination for foreign direct investment that is displaced from the United Kingdom as a result of Brexit. And we have a very strong investment offering. Um, you know, we've a, a very positive and, and favourable business climate. We've a very well-educated workforce and the availability, strong availability of skills in Ireland. And we have a track record of being a, uh, a very good location for uh, internationally trading businesses to, uh, to base their European operations. Um, and as a result of that, we will certainly be seeking, uh, insofar as we can, um, to uh, attract any foreign direct investment that might be displaced from the United Kingdom as a result of this, uh, as a result of this process as it, as it continues. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan earlier asked you about the balance of trade between uh, Ireland and the EU and Ireland and the UK. Uh, can you explain how that balance has, has changed as a result of Ireland's EU membership? Very significantly. I mean, I, I think the statistic is that when we, Ireland and the UK both originally uh, applied to join the, the, the then European Economic Community back in the early 1960s. And I think the statistic was at that stage, and I'm open to correction on this, but I think the statistic was that at that stage, nearly 80% of all Irish exports were sold into the United Kingdom market. Um, last year, it was 17%. We, in contrast, sold between 40 and 45% of our exports into the continental European market, into, into the, what, what will be the EU27 market uh, post-Brexit. Um, that is, is really a remarkable uh, diversification in our export trade over the, uh, the 40 years or so of our, our European Union membership. Um, the ability to access continental European markets uh, freely and without hindrance, uh, the, the participation of Ireland in the single European market has really revolutionised our, our economy and allowed us uh, to trade in a very different way uh, to the way that we could trade prior to our European Union membership and uh, it has had very, very significant consequences for Ireland. And I take it that that has resulted in uh, an attitude um, amongst Irish people towards the EU that's is strengthening as, uh, as this process, this Brexit process, strengthened uh, feelings towards the EU in Ireland? There is very widespread public support for the European Union and for continued Irish European Union membership. The latest figure that I saw was a survey carried out, I think, in August, which suggested that 88% of the Irish population uh, are in favour of continued Irish membership of the European Union, which is a, an overwhelming figure. Um, Ireland has a very strong European identity. Uh, we see European Union membership and participation in the European mainstream as a very important part of who we are. And it has been something which has been, I suppose, key to the effective assertion of Irish sovereignty um, in, in the last 40 or 45 years. Uh, the idea that we are participating as an equal in discussions with, with the traditional great powers of Europe around the table in Brussels, that we can influence uh, the, the policy of the European Union in so many areas as it evolves, um, is something which is very important uh, for our international influence and our ability to shape the world around us in a way that is favourable to our interests. And I think that's understood and appreciated by, uh, by Irish people. Yeah. So you think when Ireland was tied to the UK, was it was a more inward-looking place? I think that's probably a fair comment in that we were, geographically, I suppose, we are an island behind an island. And uh, 
there probably was a sense of, of us being, to a degree, politically and socially and economically, uh, cut off from the European mainstream uh, up to the early 1970s. I mean, we, we were always very keen participants in, in processes of European dialogue and integration. We were founder members of the Council of Europe in, in 1949, for example, and we've always had a very strong commitment to multilateralism and our membership of, of the United Nations and, and broader multilateral policy processes. But membership of the European Union did change Ireland very significantly, socially, economically, and politically. And uh, it did allow us, I think, to, uh, to broaden our political and economic horizons in a very important way. Uh, can I thank you, uh, Mr. Hanafy, for giving evidence to us today? And uh, I shall now have a short break to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you again. Okay, thank Thanks you. To spend.
Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the current debate on EU citizens' rights in relation to the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations. I'd like to welcome our witnesses, Professor Shona Douglas-Scott, Anniversary Chair in Law, Co-Director Centre for Law and Society in a Global Context, Queen Mary School of Law, University of London, Dr Tobias Locke, Senior Lecturer in EU Law and Co-Director of the Europa Institute, University of Edinburgh, and Dr Rebecca Zane, Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, I'd like to invite Professor Shona Douglas-Scott to make a few opening remarks. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I'd like to make three brief remarks, one concerning uh, the possible future status of EU citizens. Secondly, a very brief remark on the state of the negotiations and its relevance to citizenship. And thirdly, a comment about the specific role of Scotland and um, immigration in all of this. Firstly, regarding citizens generally, I think as a result of what we've seen so far, we can't be in any doubt that the role of EU citizens is going to change after Brexit. And this is in contrast to some of the remarks that were said before the EU referendum. For example, by um, Vote Leave, who said it would be irresponsible to scare EU nationals by hinting their status might change after Brexit. No one is suggesting such a thing. Well, what we've seen of the documents, the UK position paper, the UK paper so far, suggests that it will change. And I'm sure we will talk about the details because some of the questions that I've seen so far um, suggest that the details in which the status of EU citizens um, will change will be brought up in this discussion. Um, but rules on family reunification or the fact that EU citizens in the UK will have to apply or reapply for settled status, I think are very important changes. Um, I think also, I know that there may be a possible question on acquired rights, but the weakness of the application of that doctrine, again, in distinction to some remarks that were made before the referendum, suggests that citizens' rights may not be able to be as protected as some might have thought. Secondly, moving on to the state of the negotiations. Um, the first stage, so-called divorce settlement. Um, citizens' rights specifically itemised as one of the three key items there, along with Northern Ireland and the budget. And we know that those negotiations are in the process of stalling somewhat, and Theresa May will give an important speech tomorrow in Florence to perhaps try and move things on. Uh, but two things I'd flag up in this context. Firstly, there seems to be no indication so far that citizens' rights negotiations and agreements can be ring-fenced in any way. Um, and I know that um, quite a few people would like that to happen, so that if there is controversy or lack of agreement over the budget, for example, citizens' rights agreement could still go ahead. Secondly, I'm not seeing too much being said about the European Parliament. Um, and their agreement will be vital because they have to agree the withdrawal agreement. So an eye should be being kept on them and what their view is. Third and final point, Scotland. Um, free movement and immigration is of particular importance in Scotland. And that point has been flagged up in various reports and various evidence that has been given to this committee. I don't see a great deal of account of that being taken by the UK government so far. And I would flag up two points on this. Um, firstly, uh, the response that came up very recently by the UK government to the House of Lords EU Committee on Devolution report, which to me suggested um, that the argument that was being made for a differentiated um, settlement for Scotland, particular reference to immigration, wasn't being taken account of. But secondly, the context of the EU withdrawal bill. Um, I know that the First Ministers are, um, have written a letter and there will be amendments put to that bill. Some of the EU competences, which will be returned after Brexit, um, according to the EU withdrawal bill, will be held in some sort of holding pattern by the UK government. 
And some of those competences have specific reference to citizens' rights. For example, free movement of health care, migrant access to benefits, um, recognition of professional qualifications. So keeping an eye on the withdrawal bill is also very important in that context. And th those are my opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Douglas Scott. Uh, just in terms of those three areas, I wonder if I could just go back mm. on some of them. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about um, ring fencing mm. uh, citizens' rights, mm. are you suggesting that um, the way things stand at the moment, uh, even if we appear to get some kind of progress on citizen mm. right, citizens' rights, if the whole deal falls through, the citizens' rights could fall through and we could be back to square one, effectively? Yeah. Well, that's my impression. Um, I, may be, I may misunderstand what is going on. I don't have an inside ear to the talks. Um, but I know Brussels has said in the past that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And the EU budget is seen as being a particularly important point. And um, certainly when there has been talk about Theresa May's speech tomorrow, the focus seems to be on what she might be offering in terms of the budget, and in particular in context of a transitional deal, rather than citizens' rights. Uh, but it would be possible to come to a separate agreement. It's possible in the law to do that on citizens' rights. Um, but I haven't seen any great will on either of the sides to do that so far. OK, thank you. And your second point that you made was on... Um the issue of um, the European Parliament, and you said not yeah. much had been said. Mm. Well, you know, Mr Barnier, who this committee mm. met last week, was very strong on paying attention to yeah. the European Parliament, and I believe he said that in his last press yeah. conference, one doesn't ignore the European Parliament's important role in signing off this deal. Uh, do you think, when you say uh, not much is said about the European yeah. Parliament, you're not talking about from mm. Mr Barney's point of view, are you talking about from other quarters? Possibly not, although I think, I mean, I think that the European Parliament so far would have less to object to from the proposals that are coming from the EU side. But even there, regarding the situation of UK nationals in the EU, there are a couple of things to be worried about that the European Parliament might not be so happy about, including the question of free movement within the European Union of UK nationals who are situated in another country. Um, I think it's important for the UK government to bear in mind um, that there has to be this, this vote in the European Parliament. And Guy Verhofstadt, who is um, very influential in that regard, has certainly been making a lot of comments about the role of citizens. Right. Uh, would Dr Locke or Dr Zane want to comment on those specific points? Well, I mean, um, I, can, I, I, I agree with what, what Professor Douglas Scott has said about uh, EU citizens' rights being bound up in that whole package of uh, uh, issues that will need to be resolved in the withdrawal agreement. And I think, the, apart from the economic issues that uh, would uh, result, or economic problems that would result from a no-deal Brexit, I think one of the most worrying results would be the situation of EU citizens, who are already facing quite a considerable amount of uncertainty because they actually don't know what their status is going to be in 18 months' time. And of course, that uncertainty now seems to be translating into difficulty finding jobs because employers don't know what their situation is going to be like in 18 months' time, and difficulty finding housing even because their landlords uh, seem to be reluctant, well, according to media reports, of course, seem to be reluctant to take them on as, as tenants. So, uh, that, but, uh, so that would be a huge problem, and I think, uh, um, for, for, for both sides, and I think uh, there, there is a, an absolute uh, need to come to an agreement here. Dr. Zane? Yes, I agree with um, everything that's been said so far. Maybe just to pick up on two of the points. One is about the status of EU uh, citizens changing after Brexit, and I assume that, um, we'll come back to this, in questions, but I think uh, this new category of settled status is particularly problematic in that regard um, for a whole host of different reasons that um, I assume we'll get into, but maybe just on a very basic level because it creates legal uncertainty for landlords, for employers, um, for uh, the NHS, uh, knowing whether they can treat an EU national and on what grounds post-Brexit, depending on what status they fall into post-Brexit. Um, and the other thing 
maybe just to flag up in relation to the EU withdrawal bill is that I assume that a lot of the detail um, in relation to settled status and what the requirements will be for that will be contained in the immigration bill, um, which uh, will come out at some point in, I assume, the near future. Um, and I wonder how feasible it is to come to a deal between the EU and the UK on the future of EU citizens' rights when a lot of the questions about how settled status, for example, will be dealt with are not clear at the minute and I assume will be in a, in a bill that is forthcoming so, at some point. Since you're on the topic, could you tease out a bit what exactly, in your view, the problems are with the settled status proposed by the UK government? Um, yes, uh, I, I, can, I can start. Yep. Um, so, uh, I think there are a number of um, problems with this idea of settled status. For a start, I don't really see the point in it for existing, uh, for EU citizens who are here and who at the cut-off date, which uh, I, I, we don't know when that's going to be, but if we assume it will be the 29th of March 2019 for want of, of any other better date, um, anybody who has permanent residence up until, up until that date will have to, under the UK government's proposals, apply for a new category of settled status. Um, now, it's not cr clear what the criteria will be for that settled status. Will it be the current criteria contained in the Citizens' Rights Directive? I think there are hints that it will not be. Um, so what will the criteria be for that status? What kind of identification will be needed? Um, the uh, Home Office leaked documents suggests that the UK government will only accept passports following Brexit rather than um, identification cards, which are forms of identification that a lot of EU citizens would use in order to live and work in the UK. What will the fees be for the settled status? Uh, I noticed that in the um, joint technical note that the European Commission has prepared. Uh, it seems to suggest that there is agreement between the parties on the fees, but actually, um, if the UK is to apply the current fees that it applies to third country nationals, then there is no agreement because those fees are prohibitively expensive. So it's not clear what the fee structure is going to be. It's also not clear to me in terms of the settled status what the role is going to be um, about temporary absences. So for anybody who has arrived pre-Brexit or during the transitional period, um, how will, for example, periods of unemployment be dealt with? Will they be dealt with under the current EU rules or um, will there be um, different criteria taken into account? What about somebody who is a part-time student and a part-time worker? At the minute, under EU law, they could apply as a worker as long as, as it, it is a, a genuine economic activity. But uh, how will that um, kind of mixed status um, affect any application for settled status? So EU citizenship at the moment is a fluid concept. You can be a student one day, you can be self-employed the next week, and then you can be a worker, and then you can uh, be a self-sufficient EU citizen, and none of that affects your status as an EU citizen in the UK and the rights that you derive from that. But how will that work under this um, settled status? Um, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll maybe stop okay, there. Thanks yeah. very much. I think I'll pass on to Liz MacDonald now. Uh, thank, thank you very much. There's clearly a lot of questions about uh, the negotiating positions of both sides, and I, I, I think there's, there's, there's an issue around, I think, Shona Douglas-Scott's already mentioned freedom of movement for UK citizens within the European Union. Uh, uh, and also, I think one that Dr. Locke has particularly highlighted, the question of uh, whether the European Union's negotiating position proposes more favourable uh, circumstances for EU citizens within the United Kingdom than apply to UK citizens, for example, in terms of family reunification. Uh, and the UK's position of refusing to set a date uh, on which any of this applies uh, looks very much like a negotiating chip rather than a serious proposition that uh, Brexit should apply for this purpose from last year, this year rather than two years' time. I wonder uh, if witnesses would comment on how far we're seeing negotiating positions that are in place to be traded away 
uh, and how far there, there are serious obstacles to uh, actually reaching agreement on this going forward. Well, I, I think if, if you look at the, the document that the European Commission has produced with the red, amber and green uh, lights, it's quite, quite interesting to note that on the one hand, the EU position is, is what, a, what I would call a maximalist position for EU citizens at the moment. Uh, they want indefinite um, uh, conservation of the status of EU citizens who've exercised their free movement rights uh, to come to the UK, um, and uh, including all those additional rights, I mean, apart from the right, of course, to remain, which is uncontroversial, additional rights like right to family reunification without having to meet the income threshold uh, that third country, uh, that, that non-EU citizens currently have to uh, meet in order to bring their spouses into the UK, and lots of other things. Um, at the same time, the EU's position on UK citizens is a little bit uh, less generous, if you will. Uh, there is um, a box where uh, the UK uh, uh, asks for the full uh, free movement rights of UK citizens, uh, including the right to now move from the member state that they're currently in to any other member state in the EU into the future. So if after Brexit, uh, a, a British citizen who's currently living in France decides to take up a job in Austria, they would, under the EU's proposal, not be able to do so, at least not under the withdrawal agreement. They'd have to meet Austrian immigration rules. Under the UK's proposal, they would be allowed to do so because they'd continue to benefit from all their EU rights. Now, of course, I mean, I think that there's a certain inconsistency in the EU's position in that regard. Uh, and um, I would imagine that that is one of those areas where the EU might budge and, 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 and give the UK uh, this right for UK citizens in return for some concessions on, on uh, say, the rights of EU citizens in, 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 in the UK. So I think these are areas where you can see that there's room for movement and uh, where there, there, I suppose there will be movement in the end. Is, is, is it fair to say that the issue of jurisdiction of the European Court uh, is in a different category and maybe something that the European Union cannot compromise on and that the United Kingdom cannot accept and therefore uh, under its current government policy and therefore uh, we have there perhaps a more difficult uh, obstacle to reaching agreement in this area? Well, possibly. I mean, I think as I think there, there, there will be but from the EU side, and I think it's, it's probably a reasonable demand, that, that there will have to be some sort of dispute settlement agreement, uh, very broadly speaking. Because if you look at, uh, especially if the UK's uh, proposals about settled status as a completely new status are introduced, it will hardly be acceptable for the EU to say, oh, OK, I mean, your courts can decide whether this is in compliance with our withdrawal agreement and we're not going to have any external body looking at this. Um, but whether this external body has to be the European Court of Justice or whether it could be some other external body uh, is, is a different question. Now, taking one step back, if you look at the rights of e uh, UK citizens in the EU, these cases, say, a UK citizen after Brexit um, gets into trouble with the law and, 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 and Germany decides to kick him out and send him back to the UK and, and, and he will say, well, no, I've got these certain rights under the, uh, under the withdrawal agreement. I, I was a permanent resident and therefore there, have to be, there, there, have, uh, there has to be a certain seriousness of the crime and of the danger I pose to society and that isn't met. That case will, of course, go to the German courts, but they will still be able to refer the question to the Court of Justice because the Court of Justice will be able to, uh, in all likelihood, will uh, be able to interpret the withdrawal agreement. It'll consider that to be part of EU law, an integral part of EU law, as they call it, and they will uh, reserve the right to interpret it for the EU. So uh, what if, if there's a similar situation with an uh, of an EU citizen living in uh, uh, Britain after, after Brexit. How is that going to happen? Well, yes, of course, they will have to bring their case before the um, immigration tribunal or wherever, whatever tribunal will be competent to hear it, and it'll go through the uh, 
through the courts in the UK, but I think the EU will require some body, either an, interna an international law body or perhaps, if, if, if we're lucky, so if you want, uh, uh, some special specialised tribunal within the UK even that promises to follow the ECJ's judgments in substance, at least on these questions. Uh, uh, the UK might accept that, uh, the EU might accept that perhaps as, as a compromise solution, but there will have to be some, some way of independent, say, uh, review of, uh, or independent uh, adjudication of the withdrawal agreement and of these rights under the withdrawal agreement for EU citizens living in the UK. I think that will be the bottom line of the UK, uh, EU's position. And the UK's position, obviously, with a prime minister having formulated a red line as far as the direct jurisdiction of the ECJ is concerned, which, which is not a technical legal term. It doesn't make any sense. But I think what she means is that there cannot be a UK case that is adjudicated by the ECJ itself. It can be a different body. It can be a different international body. It may even apply the same law. And it may even follow indirectly whatever the e ECJ is saying in substance, but it can't be the ECJ itself. That's, so I, I think there is room for compromise. It'll be a technical challenge, and maybe it'll create a, 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 a monster in, in adjudicative terms, but it can be resolved. I don't know if other witnesses have a view on those. Um, well, those. I completely agree with what my colleague has said. Um, i just add a couple of short comments. Um, firstly, about how much room is there for agreement or compromise. Um, there are bits and pieces where the e EU and UK are differing, but I suppose the fundamental difference is that the UK foresees um, a totally independent new settled status in UK law. Now, so much is clear. Um, and that is pretty fundamentally different. And in some ways, it's quite understandable. Britain will have left the EU. But the whole point was to apply Britain's own laws. And um, the UK government has said that equality with nationals should be the basis. So um, why should it be the case that an EU citizen, say 20 years from now, should have a more favorable right to bring in their foreign national spouse than a UK national? So one can see to a certain extent the UK government's approach there, um, but that is a very basic difference. The status of the citizenship is going to change. EU citizens will not have the same rights. Um, when it comes to enforcing those rights, clearly that's really, really important. And I just add two short comments to what Dr. Locke has said. Um, firstly, I think the withdrawal agreement, if it's concluded, has to be really, really clear. And the EU has said that it should have direct effect. The UK has not said that. And to have direct effect would mean that that agreement could be directly um, enforced in UK courts without any need for an intervening act of the Westminster Parliament. Um, but the UK is a dualist country, which means that we enforce international treaties through acts of Parliament. So there is a difference of opinion over that. And um, caught in the middle are those citizens who may have concerns about their rights being violated and what are they going to do. Um, it's all very well, I think, to say that there may be compromise on the CJEU having some sort of role. But we have to remember the court itself. And the court itself hasn't been always very cooperative. Um, and Tobias knows more than anybody, I think, about the recent accession agreement to the mm. European Convention, where it was the European Court of Justice who stepped in and said, no, this won't do. Um, this conflicts with certain aspects of EU law. And it is autonomous. And we should have the final say. So I think that is a problem to think about. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Mari Gujon. Thank you. It was just really to tease out uh, and move on from uh, Lewis MacDonald's question there. Uh, Dr Locke, in your written evidence to the committee, uh, you talk about, uh, it was according to Article 344 T TFEU, um, about the dispute, dispute resolution. You said that this means that the EU, the EU cannot conclude an agreement with a third country, such as the UK in future, which would hand over such jurisdiction to a court other than the ECJ. Uh, so do you think that that's something potentially that will the EU stick to that position then or do you think there will be room for manoeuvring on that point? 
Well, what I mean by this is that the, the proposal that has been mooted by some, and I think it was probably on some blogs or whatever, uh, uh, that um, you could have a joint, tri joint international court that will decide about these rights um, in a binding manner, both for the EU and for the UK, which would seem to be the fairest option in many respects, is, I think, constitutionally impossible under EU law. And it is something the EU simply cannot agree to because they know if they do, the ECJ will come around and say this is invalid. So um, that is one of the, I mean, it's just one of those, and that's why we are likely to get kind of a, a bifurcated system where we have two two courts, like we currently have in the under the EEA agreement. There, An attempt had been made to have one common EEA court that would decide both for the EU and for the other countries, Norway, Liechtenstein, those, uh, and the ECJ struck it down and said, well, no, we can't have that. We have to be the ones interpreting EU law. Now, of course, there could be, uh, it could, of course, be that the ECJ will change its mind on these things, and you never know. Uh, with courts, they, 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 they find ways of distinguishing earlier precedent, but I don't think the EU is going to risk that uh, and agree an agreement that they can't constitutionally comply with. Uh, and that'll then have to be reopened for negotiations. So I think the EU is very much aware of this. And I, I think there's one important aspect to bear in mind about the negotiations as a whole, is that there are certain constitutional limits to what the EU negotiators can agree. And they're not political limits. They're not set by the council. They're not set by Mr. Barnier or by any, anyone else, but they are contained in the treaties. And unless and that's not going to happen. The EU member states went ahead and said, we are going to put this into the treaties that the ECJ must not interfere with our agreement with the UK under any circumstances, something along those lines. Uh, this, there, there are certain limits that can't be negotiated away. So I think that is important to realise. Sorry, I don't know if that's something that the others want to comment on as well. Um, I don't want to comment on the specifics of what external tribunal, whether it's some kind of joint committee, arbitration, whether it's the CJEU or something that approaches the EFTA court. Um, but I would like to say something at some point, and I don't know if now is the appropriate time, about enforcing um, people's rights, because I think the situation will change quite radically after Brexit in the UK. And it's important not to forget that and to think about how they can be enforced. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether now or maybe later. Be the time okay, thank you. Um, we took some really interesting evidence mm -hmm. last week. I don't know if you, if you were able to, to catch any of that. Um, but uh, one quote we had from Professor Sir David Edward said, it is a bizarre kind of dream wish that we can play on this playing field on equal terms but still have our own referee. It's just mm -hmm. absurd in reference to the UK's uh, position. Uh, in certain areas. Do you think that that's a fair assertion to make in terms of the UK's position at the moment? Or, Well, I do think it's fair, but given that um, the whole implication of Brexit is to take back control, there will be a lot of people who will be very disappointed if the outcome does not involve um, a much greater um, competence for UK authorities. And this comes to the, the, the point I was trying to get at, which is at present, if you are an a EU citizen in the UK and say you've got um, a wrongful notification from the Home Office, like happened quite mm -hmm. recently, 100 people were sent um, errors telling them to leave the country, you get one of those, you can go to the UK courts and enforce your rights there, your EU rights there. You don't even have to go to the European Court of Justice if the point isn't contentious. But after Brexit, that will go. And if there's an argument that the UK, specifically the Home Office, is doing something that contravenes the withdrawal agreement, there's this huge question of what's going to happen. I mean, who is going to determine whether that interpretation is in line with the withdrawal agreement or not? And UK courts might say, well, this is international law and, you know, we can try and observe it, but if we are faced with an act of parliament, we have to apply that act of parliament. And um, this is where a joint committee or some other tribunal would be 
very, very useful, but then you come across the obstacles that Dr. Lott referred to, of the idea of the autonomy of the ECJ and whether that would be permissible. And there's also the point that I think David Edward has made, that if we have a, a third type of tribunal, how is it going to be funded? How many personnel will it have? Who will be its judges? Who will appoint them? Mm -hmm. How much will this cost? And so on and so on. I think that's one point that does make me really concerned for the future. Mm -hmm. I think given all the questions you've raised about mm -hmm. settled status as well, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we'll have million, well, millions of mm -hmm. EU citizens applying, potentially applying for the settled mm -hmm. status, how will the Home Office deal with that, cope with that, mm -hmm. in light of everything that will have yeah. to be set up to deal with that as well? I think it's a yeah, very complex mm -hmm. situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ross Greer. Relatively uh, brief question. The UK government isn't really capable of fulfilling its own position on this, is it? And on a purely logistical basis, the demand that they would create simply far outstrips the capacity and we would result in astronomical waiting times for European citizens currently living here to have any applications processed. I think, I think that's right. I mean, if... Uh, I read a statistic last week, I think, that at the minute, at current levels, it would take the Home Office somewhere between 30 and 140 years just to process permanent residence applications at the current rate at which they're doing it. Um, I mean, I think the easiest thing for those, um, and I was um, reading through the report that the committee, this committee produced um, on uh, citizens' rights, a lot of the majority of EU citizens in the UK and certainly in Scotland will have been here for longer than for five years or longer at the point that the UK leaves the EU in March 2019. Um, so I think the easiest thing really would be to, and a lot of those from anecdotal evidence seem to now be applying for permanent residence. So why not just simplify your life and say that you can send in your permanent residence card and receive settled status or indefinite leave to remain um, and just slot citizens into the current immigration system. I, I think that would make the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's a point I would have made. And I think also just the, the fact that the, the, the UK government is saying the process will be streamlined and efficient, but so far what we've been seeing from the Home Office is the reverse. Uh, misinformation and errors that makes one a bit sceptical about a future streamlined process. Thank you. That will do. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. It's just it's a question regarding uh, residence rights. Now, in evidence that we have received from the UK law societies, um, they state that uh, residence rights alone may become meaningless if not accompanied by the right to continue economic activities. Now, per the situation, particularly with multinationals, is that uh, there is a, a growing number of people who have got, who work from home, uh, but they are they are. Uh, the particular office that they'll be uh, located uh, towards uh, might well be in a, in a different uh, country within the EU. And so how do you think this situation will actually be resolved? Uh, or, and, and do you think that, that there is an understanding uh, of uh, this type of situation that, that, uh, that does exist? I, I think um, that so in your example, would it be somebody who, say, works from home in the UK, but whose actual place of work is in Germany? It could be, for yes. I mean, so it's, I mean, somebody who might work for like, IBM mm -hmm. um, and uh, they used to work uh, in, in the office in uh, or Paris or whatever, uh, but, uh, but they, they do live somewhere in the UK. And but because of uh, maybe a restructure, they now work from home. Yes, I, I suppose the answer to that would be at what, when they started doing that in the UK, so whether they would fulfil the, the residence rights in order to get this settled status, the residence criteria in order to get the settled status, which, according to the um, proposal that we have from the UK government, would give them equality with UK nationals, I guess, to then continue to work in the UK, even if they're they're working as a... As a virtual worker, um, so working from home. Um, I, I'm not, I suppose the other question that comes into this are frontier workers who maybe w live in one place and, and work in another. Um, I, 
I'm not sure that I can give you a satisfactory answer on how they would, would be dealt with. I, I don't know if uh, either of you have, have views on that. Suppose if they have been frontier workers at the cut-off date, they will probably be caught by that uh, agreement. But I think it is... Imp uh, and and if, if you look at the at that uh, uh, red, amber, green uh, document of the of the European Commission, uh, they have they seem to have a, reached agreement on frontier workers. What exactly the agreement is, I don't know, but I suppose that their st status will continue as it was. There is, of course, an issue, perhaps, with evidence uh, uh, because they mightn't be able to produce it as easily uh, as as workers who are resident here have got, I don't know, a mortgage and they can show that they've lived here for X amount of time and that they've worked here for X amount of time. It might be more difficult with frontier workers. Um, but I think these are practicalities which should be, should be possible to sort it out. But I think what the, the situation you mentioned is an important one because that is probably quite, quite common, in, uh, especially with, with spouses of people who are currently working, physically working in the UK and, you know, they might have, they might come along and and do their work from home because they weren't able to relocate or weren't able to find a job in the UK that would, was adequate for them. Can I just add something? That, um, I think frontier workers is important here, and the negotiations are extremely vague on that. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, though, moving away from the negotiations, if we are talking about somebody who is working from home, say, in Scotland, um, and has some sort of, um, is providing some sort of service in Germany, um, if they can show they have a property or a contractual right, some private law right, they may be able to rely on acquired rights or on the European Convention to enforce that, um, the right to um, some sort of property, um, because Article 1 of the European Convention covers the right to property. So they may have a claim against the UK government on that basis. Um, of course, litigating is probably the last thing they want to do, but... Um, it shouldn't be forgotten. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. If I could just come in on a supplementary there, I mean, notwithstanding the very specific point that Stuart McMillan made, um, my understanding is that the, the UK Law Society's uh, point was that they were concerned that there wasn't a right to continue economic mm. activities, yeah. there were yeah. only residence rights, so That's it's right. actually yeah. broader than that specific yeah. example, isn't it? It's yeah. about the right to engage in cross-border business activity. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are you saying that that's um, that? Do you share the concern of the UK law societies that those rights aren't properly entrenched? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. I think this, but this raises another um, point about free movement of services and freedom of establishment, which are related rights that EU citizens also have. You know, the freedom to set up a business in another country, um, the freedom to provide a service, and um, one category of. Uh, workers that is mentioned in the proposals are, the, are posted workers. Now, the EU has said that posted workers will not be dealt with under citizens' rights because they fall under free movement of services rather than under the citizenship provisions and the, and the free movement of workers provisions and the treaty, whereas the UK wants posted workers to be included in citizens in the citizens' rights discussion. Um, and I, I do think that it is, it is not just... It is concerning that the citizens' rights paper um, doesn't take into account all of the all of the um, ancillary ancillary rights, I suppose, that EU citizens benefit from, such as to provide a service or to set themselves up. And as far as I know, we haven't seen a UK position paper on either of those areas. And I would imagine it'll get even more complicated in the future because all the, the, the free trade agreements that the EU signed do, do not cover services. Free trade agreements don't cover services. So can you see a particular problem developing for people engaged in service industries? Uh, if if that includes a cross-border aspect of it, yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I do see a problem in that area. I mean, there is the option post-Brexit, the, the EU has adopted certain directives in relation to, for example, intra-company transfers um, that might then come into, into play for British workers who were working for short periods abroad uh, and coming back. But those are directives that are 
base that are aimed at third country nationals at the minute, and they, can, they don't contain nearly as many rights, positive rights, for workers who are, are being transferred or who are being sent into the EU um, as are currently uh, protected under citizens' rights. Thank you. Uh, Dean Lockhart. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. I had a follow-up um, on the potential alternative to the European Court of Justice mentioned by Dr. Logg. As I understand it, the, there's a bifurcated system where there's a separate court that exists for potentially disputes between EEA members and uh, presumably the uh, European Union. Um, that potentially might be a template going forward as, as a compromise between the EU position and, and the UK paper. Could you briefly talk us through what, what that involves, how, what, the, the functionality of that separate court? Sure. Um, so, under, as you know, the, there, there, there is the EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, which has four members, uh, Liechtenstein, Norway, Iceland and Switzerland. And three of them, all but Switzerland, decided to join the EU and the EU member states in the European economic area, which basically extends the single market, very simply speaking, to those three countries, but not to Switzerland. And the court that is in charge of looking after the, the, those three EFTA countries, uh, 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 well, issues arising in those three F EFTA countries is called the EFTA court. It's a bit of a misnomer. It should be called the EEA court or something, but it's called the EFTA court. Um, it's also in Luxembourg, um, and it works in a fairly similar way to the ECJ in that the um, courts of uh, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Iceland are allowed to ask the EFTA court for interpretations of EEA law, uh, much like the courts of the EU member states are allowed to ask the ECJ. The main difference is that this answer they get back is not strictly binding on them. Uh, it's, it's an advisory opinion rather than a, a, a binding judgment, which is what we get from the ECJ. So there's one difference. Uh, now, of course, the EFTA court interprets broadly the same or often exactly the same rules as the ECJ. So a lot of EU regulations will, be tra will have been translated into EEA law uh, and will be binding on uh, EEA members. And in those interpretations, well, the EFTA court is only, strictly speaking, bound to follow everything the ECJ has done before 1990. Two, I suppose, when the FEA agreement entered into force. So much of that is still relevant, but some of it is no longer relevant because the legislation may no longer be, apply. And um, as, as far as new uh, uh, e, 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 um, ECJ judgments are concerned, the EFTA court, well, in practice, will follow them if they apply to the EEA. They, will not, they are not technically bound, strictly speaking, but they have to Follows, they, they do follow step in order to achieve the overall aim of the EEA agreement, which is homogeneity. The, the single market is supposed to work in the same manner in Norway and in uh, France. Uh, there, there shouldn't be any difference for operators. This is the whole point. The, the only reason we have the two courts is because the ECJ threw a spanner in the works uh, in 1991 uh, and said we, we have to decide for our part, uh, uh, for our, well, now 28 member states what the EEA agreement means, and you can decide yourselves, but please follow us as far as you can. And, uh, and I think that is, the, one of the, that is the main difference between the two courts. So there's a little, I mean, there is, there is evidence that the EFTA court doesn't always follow the ECJ. Of course, cases come to courts in a random manner, and, and often the EFTA court will be the court first asked a certain question. There may not be any ECJ precedent, and it'll have to answer it. Uh, and there are situations where the EFTA court, especially on immigration, actually, where it deviates a little bit from the ECJ, because, of course, there is no EU citizenship in the EEA. The EEA has free movement of workers. It has freedom of establishment. But it doesn't have the added um, umbrella of EU citizenship, which gives certain, well, which gives an additional status. I mean, the rights, really, the individual rights are not that different at all, because uh, EEA will accept, broadly speaking, whatever is in the citizenship directive. But uh, the, the, say the, the overall aim of achieving EU citizenship and uh, what the ECJ calls the, the fundamental status of EU citizens, being EU citizenship, that doesn't apply in the 
in the EEA, and I think uh, and there are there is some evidence of the EFTA court deviating from ECJ case law in those cases on those grounds. Yes, I wanted to come back on the question I'd asked earlier whether there was an element of uh, bargaining position from the EU's approach uh, on a number of areas. The most obvious example, it seems to me, of a, a bargaining position from the UK point of view is this question of what is the cut-off date. So currently, as I understand the UK position, anyone who has arrived here since March from another EU country uh, will not know uh, at, at this juncture, whether the UK is proposing or not proposing uh, that their citizenship, that they should be eligible to apply for settled status, for example, or that any of their other, uh, any of the other provisions of the withdrawal agreement will apply to them. And that seems to be on the table uh, as presumably a negotiating uh, a chip. But can I ask, what is the consequence of that uncertainty? What are the, the because um, we don't yet know when the cut-off date is going to be. What does that mean for those citizens, and what does that mean for the overall shape of the, agree of the withdrawal agreement? Well, I mean, part of that would be a, a question that, that's, that's not legal, simply about um, how that impacts on the everyday life of those people living in a state of uncertainty. But moving to a legal impact, um, I guess that something the UK should bear in mind is I suppose there might be um, claims brought under the European Convention, Article 8, um, the right to respect for one's private life on the basis of uncertainty and stress that could be caused by not knowing um, what one's status is. Um, and that should be borne in mind. I mean, Article 8, I think, lies behind a lot of the discussion on, on citizens' rights because it does cover the personal, private life of people. So that is relevant to bear in mind. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it is being used as a bargaining chip, I agree. And um, I, you know, I, don't, I don't quite know legally what one could do to, to change that situation. It seems to be a political matter of you know, negotiation and discussion. Is the, is, it, is the UK's position potentially inconsistent on this matter with its position on other things, because and, and the legal position on other things, because presumably everything else, trading arrangements, uh, existing treaty obligations, will all come to an end on a given day, probably the 29th of March 2019, but at the moment potentially this, this may be out of step with all those other obligations. Is that, a, is that a legally defensible position in its own right, in its own terms? Well, perhaps just as, a, as an add-on, I mean, I, I, I can leave your questions. It's, it's almost, uh, I would say, uh, uh, the answer is, yeah. Well, I mean, legally, you can have different, you know, I mean, you can have different regimes for everything if you, if you, if you so choose. But it would, of course, create uh, an, 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 an uh, an inconsistency, a logical inconsistency. And of course, uh, we mustn't forget that under the current legal position, EU citizens have a right still to come here, to take up work, to do whatever else they were able to do before, uh, um, before uh, March 2017, or indeed before the EU referendum was ever mentioned. And um, that those are rights under the EU treaties, and they continue they will continue to uh, be protected up until the moment that the UK leaves the EU. And I think there is a, I mean, I think it's a, it's a general uh, uh, almost principle of, of law that we have, always have to be very careful when it comes to the retroactive uh, and retrospective application of new rules. And there have to be very good reasons for them. I mean, in criminal law, they are always prohibited. You can never do that. And I suppose because immigration status goes to the very heart of uh, a person's uh, private or of a person's life, because uh, you know they don't know where they're going to live and how they're going to earn their living in the future, is, is, is goes to the very heart of a person's existence. Uh, I would be very careful uh, with that also, especially in light of. Uh, the uh, human rights law and the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, there is some precedent on, say, expulsion uh, and 
uh, and Article 8 of the uh, um, uh, European Convention. There's also a precedent on the deprivation of permanent residency in the in the aftermath of uh, disintegration of uh, Yugoslavia, where certain individuals simply lost, because they had the wrong citizenship, they were Croatians, but they were living in Slovenia, which, of course, before the dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia didn't matter, because it was the same state. Uh, and they uh, uh, were deprived of their status uh, uh, as, as residents, uh, because, and, and even though there was a registration period and all, all of that, but they missed it for various uh, reasons, because they were in hospital or they didn't know about it. And the European Court of Human Rights intervened, and it said, well, this is contrary to their right of uh, family life. Now, these are extreme circumstances, and not, every, and not every change in the status of EU citizens will automatically be a violation of Article 8 of the European Convention. No, that's not the case. But I think retrospective uh, 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 arrangements are always very suspicious from a legal certainty point of view and from a rule of law point of view, and, and that is where one might win in, in Strasbourg. Yeah. Could I just add something? Is that we don't yet know what the exit date will be. The EU withdrawal bill says it's for a minister to determine, and in fact they could determine different exit dates for different aspects of the law under that bill. Maybe give uh, one example where it might make um, a legal difference as to when the cutoff date is, and that is in relation to family members. Um, especially, so in relation to family members of EU citizens in the UK, because the UK's position paper and the EU's one makes a difference, but or differs between, differentiates between current and future family members, um, and the cutoff date will be the date at which it is determined whether somebody is a current family member or a future family member, and the implications that that has for it but not just for um, EU citizens in the UK, but also for UK citizens in the EU who will want to come back either with an EU family member who will, after the cut-off date, be a third country national, presumably, um, and will have to apply for a, a, a visa under the immigration rules, and also for um, a UK citizen who is coming back with a third country national spouse from another EU member state who, at the minute, um, if, if a UK citizen has lived abroad in another EU member state and then comes back, is exercising their citizenship rights, so could apply for a visa for their third country national spouse under EU rules on family members, but that will not apply after the cutoff date, so they will then have to apply under the immigration rules, which has serious cost implications and also serious implications in terms of that family member's right to work. So, so, so if the United Kingdom government wanted to avoid a complete legal minefield, it would abandon any proposal for a cutoff date that was earlier than the date of withdrawal from the European Union. Or, or maybe just to give legal certainty as to when that cutoff date will be. You know, if that cutoff date is earlier, say it's March 2018, then that's fine if they announce that tomorrow, because people can then work with that and, and know what the implications of that might be. Um, but I think this this um, uncertainty, which almost suggests that the cutoff date might have been, you know, almost six months ago, um, creates havoc for individuals' lives, but but also for you know landlords or employers um, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. What are the implications of uh, the talks collapsing without a deal? Not very good. <laughs> well, I, I think. Well, I mean, I think there would be uh, there would be legal uncertainty. Well, that goes without saying. But I think what would happen is that on. 29th of March 2019, the UK would leave the EU, it would no longer be an EU member state, EU law would cease to apply to the UK, it would no longer be directly applicable in the, in the UK. Now, and the same would go for uh, EU law as far as UK citizens are concerned in the rest of the EU, presumably. Now, what would need to happen, I think on both sides, would need to, there would need to be unilateral r rules at dealing with, all, with the fallout of all of this, and, and some of these rules will have to relate to the status of EU citizens living in the, e, uh, in the UK and UK citizens living in the EU, 
what is their future status. Now, under the EU withdrawal bill, in theory, the Citizens' Rights Directive, well, I mean, there will be a separate immigration bill, but I imagine that uh, a lot of these rights could simply be transferred into UK law, and if the government was in a benign mood, it could uh, decree that these rights will continue and everything will be fine. The same could be done at the EU level, of course, but there is no guarantee that that will be the case, and there is almost, it is almost certain that the rights of UK citizens in the EU and EU citizens in the UK will differ, which is something that I think both sides at the moment will want to avoid. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and, and we don't know, and I think, I mean, I, I'm not sure if everyone agrees, but we don't know what the, whether there are broader protections out there, either in the common law for people who've exercised rights in the past and are now deprived of them. We, we don't know. We don't know whether under EU law for UK citizens living in the EU, EU law will still apply somehow. Uh, they will still be able to go to courts and there will be references to the European Court of Justice asking, so what happens to somebody who's lost their EU citizenship because their member state has left the EU? Can they still re rely on something like acquired rights? Or But th there's, there's absolutely no certainty on that point at all. So we, w we would have to wait and see. I think um, the, the, the one point I'd add to that is that there might be uh, a difference between the situation of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the EU in that the EU has EU rules for third country nationals and there is a long-term residence directive. So that might apply to UK nationals, say, who've been in Spain for five years or more. Um, and so their situation might be a bit more certain than that of the EU nationals in the UK. Now, those EU rules are not nearly as generous as they are for EU citizens, but they do provide a level of protection. And they even provide a level of protection for free movement for certain types of long-term resident to go from one member state to another. The problem is that they generally protect residents who can demonstrate that they have um, a, a stable income of a certain amount, that they have been resident for more than five years. So they would cover those in the better off categories, not say somebody who'd gone to work as a, a, bar, a barman or, or somebody in, in, in Spain, something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I agree with the, the previous comments. I would assume that for UK citizens living in the EU in the event of a, a, a no deal, um, that they would eventually uh, fall under limited EU rules on third country migration and or the member state rules in the member state that they find themselves in. Um, and there are certain common rules um, at EU level on third country migration um, around students, researchers, around highly skilled uh, migrants, uh, intercorporate transfers and very, very limited protections for seasonal work. And then obviously there's the, the long term residence directive. Um, but uh, for a lot of these these rules, there is limited equal treatment or no equal treatment. Um, there are limits on the amount of work that you can do, the kind of work that you can do, the extent to which you can move employers. Um, and uh, yes, I think I think eventually it would just fall under under the common rules. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence today, and we will now uh, go into private session. <laughs>